To start our program, you ready, Jerry? I could not be happier to introduce you all to Jerry Hanley. If you've not heard Jerry speak before, I think you're in for a real treat. Um, Jerry is one of my OER idols. He's been at this work for a long time and brings a wealth of experience to, to the table. Um, Dr. Hanley is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Academic Technology Services at the California State University System and the Executive Director, Executive Director of something, if you do any OER work you've probably heard of before, Merlot, um, which is the Multimedia Educational Resource for Learning and Online Teaching. Jerry oversees system-wide academic technology initiatives, including digital library services, course redesign with technology, affordable learning solutions, accessible technology, and Cal State Online. If we don't, he has no spare time left to do anything else. At Merlot, he directs the development and sustainability of the International Consortium and Technology Strategy to provide open educational services to improve teaching and learning. Jerry's previous positions include Professor of Psychology, Director of Faculty Development, and Director of Strategy Planning at CSU Long Beach. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry braved the storm that we just had in Chicago last night. Um, I blamed him for bringing it across the country with him. But thank you so much for traveling, particularly on Memorial Day weekend, to join us here today. Please uh, join me in welcoming Jerry to the stage. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just MJ, just you know, is just wonderful. You are so lucky to have her here, and I really appreciate your friendship over the years. Um, as uh, MJ said, uh, I'm from the California State University System. Thank you. And uh, I've been there 133 years <laughs> um, because working in the Chancellor's Office is like dog years. One year is seven years off your life. But what happens, though, is that you really get a chance to learn a lot because you're working with so many people. And, and I, I would say, if you ever want to stay innovative, what you have to do is realize that other people's problems are more important than your own. And when you attend to all the people you're trying to serve, they'll keep you as creative as you could ever want to be. And what I'd like to do today is really share with you what we've been trying to do in California that can help you think about how to scale the impact of what many of you are doing individually in, with an institution. Because it's a challenge working in higher education. And what are some models that you can bring home? Because you ever have a great idea and you go to your campus and do they say, oh my goodness, MJ, that's the wonderful thing, I'll change my life. Does that, is that how you get your reaction? Or is it, well, let's have a committee and then we'll talk about it and da da da. All right, so what I'd like to do is begin with a story. Anybody know Stone Soup? There's a line, you know, everything I needed to learn in life is what I learned in kindergarten. Now this story is really going to be critical in helping you think about what you have to do to really transform your institution to become the learning center, the dynamic way of using open education resources and lots of other resources. And I'll, and I'll tell the story briefly. So it's, think of it's the late 1700s. There are three soldiers coming back from the war. They're tired, they're hungry. And then they see a town and they go, ah, oh, maybe these people will be nice to us and give us some food and some drink. So they start walking down the road and then the townspeople see the soldiers coming. And what do soldiers do? Ah, oh, they always take our food, right? They take our drink, right? So let's hide everything. So the soldiers come to town. The mayor comes out looking tired and hungry. And the soldiers go, we've had a long travel. Do you have anything for us to eat? And they go, oh, sorry, the, the harvest has been horrible. Go to the next town, they were much better. And then the first soldier goes, ah, I see. You're having trouble like us, hungry. We'll show you how to make stone soup. And the mayor goes, stone soup? If we can learn make, to make soup from stones, we'll never go hungry. So the soldier goes, get your largest pot, put it in the center of town, build a fire on it, fill it up with water. We'll take care of the rest. 
So they go, all right, let's do this. So they put a huge pot in the center of town. The soldiers go out to the field, carefully pick up three large stones. And everyone's wondering, how could this be? How could this be? So they drop one, two, three, and everyone's looking. Then the second soldier goes, you know, if we only had some carrots, it would really add flavor to this. And someone goes, oh, I have carrots. They run home, chop them up, stick it in the soup. And they go, you're right. And then the third soldier goes, you know, if we only had some cabbage, I have cabbage, run home, chop it up, put it in, a little bit of beef, a little bit of salt, pepper, etc. And then by the end of the day, you have this huge stew and the mayor goes, this is wonderful. Let's have a celebration. Put tables out in the middle of town. Everyone, whether you contribute or not, come and join us for this feast. They have a wonderful time. The soldiers get put up in the best beds in, in the town. And the next morning, the soldiers are ready to go off and they say, and the, and the mayor goes, thank you so much for teaching us how to make stone soup. Now all that is going to enable you to implement the vision that MJ laid out, okay? <laughs> now how? Because one of the challenges you have in higher education is the complexity and it can get overwhelming to think about all the different elements that you have to manage to be successful. And so when you, let's start breaking this down, the first step is about engaging people and opening doors. The people came to town. And what I'm gonna do is go through all these different elements about how your plan can implement stone soup where OER really becomes the soup in which everyone can draw upon. The soldiers had to come down and validate needs, right? They said, you're hungry too. This is important. And are you ready for something different? Then they excited curiosity by saying, we can make stone soup. And the people go, how can you make stone soup? You're, that means you're getting people to desire to do something different. Now, did they say put the pot in someone's barn where no one else sees it? Or is it about putting something in the open that makes things visible? And then it's not, Lucy, go get the carrots, put it in here, right? And administrate. Is that how you work in higher education? You're not going to last very long if you do that, right? It's about a shared governance process, about an invitation that allows people to put what they can into the community's kind of space. And by offering personal con contributions, you now get buy-in. They now become part of the solution. They now become part of the community that is contributing and really they begin to own it. And then if you keep it quiet, who knows? You gotta publicize it. When the mayor said, let's celebrate, enjoy the fruits of your labor, and look what we've accomplished. And at the end, always saying thank you. So these are some critical elements. And now we're gonna go start applying this specifically to your OER initiative. This is what you've done. You have created an engagement of people, bringing people face to face in a meeting, bringing people to town. Did the soldiers send a memo? Say, hey, do you have any food? Right? Or did they come in and engage people? This is so important when you're thinking about how, if you want change to happen, how do you bring people together? Validating needs. Now this is a really important element, and, and we spent some time in the CSU working on this. Affordability is not about the price of textbooks. It's about what students can pay. And this is where you have to begin to say, understanding the needs and the lives of your students become an a critical element 
to developing a strategy and to engage people on why they need to look at affordable learning solutions. And when you think about this, how do you educate people about often what the students' needs are, looking for data that people know about? And in California, 49% of our students are Pell awardees. 80% of our students are on some amount of financial aid. We have a half a million students in the CSU. So are you gonna say affordability is not an issue for them? Further, how do you make this even more concrete? 11% of our students are homeless some part of the year. 41% are food insecure part of the year. Do you know how many students are homeless in Maryland? Do you know how often they're hungry? Because when you understand what students' lives are like, what they're trying to survive through to get their education, and you have a $200 textbook, and that's rent, that's a month of food, and you're gonna say that book is gonna compete with students' lives? So understanding, validating the needs of students is, gonna, is very important, and we have a survey, you can look at what we did, we, all that other stuff, and because it, it begins to help contextualize this open education, the affordability strategy for your students. And what's the consequence of students not buying books? Does it impact their academic success? Right? And do you think Florida students and Maryland students and California students and Georgia students, you think they're a whole lot different? When you're going to a community college or a state institution, right? They're gonna be pretty similar. And when you look at, and, and this is a survey that they've conducted for since 2014, I think, every two years. 64% don't purchase at least one book. 43% take fewer courses. 40% say they don't register for a specific course because they can't afford the book. 36% say they earned a poor grade. 23% dropped a course. So it's not just our students have trouble affording books, it has an impact on their success, right? You don't have access to the content, how are they gonna be able to engage in the learning process? How does it make them feel when they're struggling against their, some of their students who do have their books? All right. Now, do you folks have a graduation initiative around here? You trying to increase the graduation rates? All right. In California, our system-wide four-year graduation rate is 23%. Our six-year graduation rate is 61%. And we made a deal with the legislators the governor's office that we had to get our four-year graduation rate to 40% by 2025. Now how is that gonna happen? Students have to take 15 units per semester. They're currently taking 13 units per semester. And if 43% are taking fewer courses because of the price of textbooks, what might be a good idea about how to student help students take more units per semester, right? Affordability becomes a, a strategic kind of a, um, activity that ties into a core goal that the institution has, right? Coming down to validating the needs of the individual students and the needs of the institution to say why is this so important. Now when students are poor you can add revenue or reduce expenses. Now in the CSU if we save students a hundred dollars per semester with a half a million students we, save a, we could save a hundred million dollars a year. Now, are they taking that money and putting it in the bank? No, this is a hundred million dollar financial aid package. 
Can you get that out of your legislator? 100, 100 million dollars? But you collectively can achieve that financial aid package for your students. Is that pretty cool? Right? Now, when we look at all of California, all our community colleges, we have three million students, right? Just think about the savings that can, and affordability, MJ is bang on, that's not the end point, but it's a critical means by which our students are gonna be able to be successful, complete their degree in a timely manner, and move on to an, a, a life with a good job and a lot of fun. All right, next part, exciting curiosity. You gotta find ways to inspire people, right? You can say, here's the problem, and they're gonna say, not mine, I'm teaching my course, right? <laughs> okay, Did you ever have that, right? I mean, I'm a full professor, professor of psychology, I've been through all that, you know, you know what the definition of faculty is? Those who think otherwise, okay? <laughs> And actually, that's a critical element of what makes up a university, is the diversity of knowledge and pursuit and opinions. It's critical. Now, how do you bring people together becomes a challenge. And how do you inspire them? Why are we here? Why are we in education? Is to help our students succeed in their learning. Now, how do we help faculty too as well? We have to help them do their teaching, make their lives a little bit easier. And uh, do we have an administrator in the room? Raise your hand, it's okay. All right, it's all right. Uh, you know, my road to ruin in administration began many years ago, right? But they really are critical facilitators for all this. All right, so let's just talk a little bit about that. Anybody take thermodynamics, uh, equilibrium in, in class, right? Is that it? Right? The old way, lecture in a book, all right? But what OER can do, there are modules out there, dynamic, where you have students being able to input different values and then see what happens. It's a, really a simulation, a chance for people to engage in the material. You can make that exciting and you can contextualize it into areas that they understand. Now here's a really critical author, Meet Loaf Goldwyn, right? Not, not quite your typical author, but putting it in the context that students can begin to understand where, how thermodynamics applies. Okay, this is my, if, if you wanna know what my principle of all that I do is, how does every action I do give a gift and not a burden? And when you work with faculty, how do you inspire them, right? It's not giving burdens. And frequently technology is, um, turns out to be a burden when they say, oh, I have this wonderful new thing. And then you say, okay, this is means I gotta spend 30 hours trying to figure this out before I can make it work, right? And I think the way to look at this, an open education resource strategy with faculty is, giving them choices of resources that they can use to achieve their goals without overwhelming them and really without costing them time. How do you support them fulfilling their personal mission that they have at that institution in teaching? And this is where open education opens doors. There's more options that are out there. OER, courseware, textbooks, open access journals that are free of cost that you have free to permission to use, and importantly, you can choose how to implement it in your own context. And this is where the five R's become really critical, that if you're gonna make an effective learning experience, how do you build that personal relationship between the student, the faculty, and the content, all right? So in, in California, um, with, um, let's see, I think we have uh, about, I don't know, 30,000 faculty members who have all their different views. When we look at affordability, we look at every dollar we save a student is a dollar to their benefit. So we look at open education resources, our libraries. 
Um, you have call, called, we have cold. The Council of Library Directors, I'm on cold. I like called a little bit better. The people are really nice in, in the librarians. I, I, Lucy, I just want you to know they're, they're really nice people, right? But we purchase about $20 million a year of academic content, digital academic content, that then provides free access to materials. And how do you get faculty working with them to use our libraries for instructional materials, right? No big deal, but sometimes it takes a little different reference support from, from our librarians. Faculty creating their own, and we work with our bookstores with publishers with low cost strategies that really can save students a lot of money. All right, now this is where you gotta help administrators too. So help the students, more effective learning, help the faculty make easier choices, and you gotta give them a gift and not a burden too. So finding resources, and MJ talked about getting money, really good, providing expertise to help them make d decisions, and the administrators, uh, how many of you have actually been prepared to do the job that you now have? I can say I'm not. I mean, I run academic technology and I'm a psychologist. What the hell am I doing here, right? <laughs> okay, right? It's on the job, right? And you're problem solve and you get advice and you learn from your colleagues, right? This is something, and this is kind of what you're doing here, is how do you get people to learn stuff? Project management is going to be essential to making all this work, and recognition for successful programs, and sharing lessons learned when things don't work out, right? So when you look at this, now what do we do in California to help this out? And MJ talked about some legislation. Um, there are two edges to that sword when you're working with legislators, right? And uh, so what we did in California, we worked, we, we got five laws passed um, to create the California Open Online Library. The acronym for that is COOL, right? It's a really cool thing, all right? And I'll show you a little bit more about that. Uh, we got money from the legislators to help support faculty adoption. We got some grants. She got more money than I did from Hewlett. I'm gonna have to work on that, right? And the other thing, so the cool, creating of the cool library provided an infrastructure to enable um, all our faculty in California to find OER. The s other f funding is to help faculty adopt, and now what's going to help students drive to those courses where they would then take to kind of create a demand side. So we had our course schedules have to identify courses that have zero cost course materials in them, right? So now you have an ecosystem of the production of courses with OER and the demand for courses with OER. And we work with our administrators and one of the things I'll talk a little bit about in a second is you gotta have a campus coordinator. It can't be a committee, but how do you have someone who's there to be a leader to help that out? And we support those folks, the, our coordinators. Um, academic Senate resolutions, part of the funding to, uh, in, uh, required our faculty to say it's okay, it's not a sin to use open education resources, right? We didn't say you had to or anything like that, but you get the Academic Senate having that conversation and then you make sure, this last part about recognition events. Um, I hand out about a half a million a year to individual campuses for programs, and a requirement is they have to throw a party at the end of the year, celebrating the accomplishments, okay? So, when we look at, after you kind of look at the people who you have to change, your faculty, your students, um, staff, and, uh, and your administrators, you gotta create that gathering place. And your um, more, most commons, all right? So for us, I had 114 community colleges, 23 state universities, 10 University of Californians who really don't wanna play with us at all uh, most of the time. A lot of faculty member, right? And so really, the open digital library is something that we all needed. So this became our OER stone suit. So we created affordable learning solutions. There's a lot of stuff here. 
Um, if you ever want me to do a webinar, just what we have here, so you can explain all the resources, see if anything is useful for you, really important. And it's about, you have to build local communities who take on the leadership role, but how do you support them at large scale? It's gotta be through technology. So really link globally in a variety of ways. And so this is our cool website. Um, how do you find materials, faculty showcase, course showcase, and I'll, again, I'll show you in a second. Faculty teach courses, so how do you begin to align from your community's perspective all the open textbooks, for example, that are aligned with courses that articulate across our community colleges, our four-year institutions, right? Virtual labs, how do you get more engaging material, not just, you know, books on the web. Um, Community colleges here? All right. Career and technical education, where is that? Anybody know where that is, stuff is? Skills Commons, all right. A lot of uh, stuff there. Skills Commons, the TACT program, the Trade Adjustment Assistance for Community Colleges and uh, Career, uh, career Training. Um, had a $4 billion project from the U.S. Department of Labor. Skills Commons is the collection of all the open education resources that was created from 700 community colleges. And I'll show you a little bit of that. Okay. So, as MJ said, Merlot, um, we're legal now, we're 22 years old, so we can drink. And, um, and just a quick highlight on this, right? You type in something and you type in DNA and you get the Merlot collection and you got stuff that's been peer reviewed, user reviewed, got lots of stuff there. Feel free to use that as much as you want. We've also, in our smart search, we search about 60 other OER and other libraries out on the web. So think of this as more of a one-stop shop. So you can pick your library. We got OER Commons there, and we have lots of others. So you can just find more materials. And we've also created a special Google search application. Like, if you type DNA into Google, uh, what will show up at the top? Will it be educationally related material or the paternity suits from the latest um, celebrity, right? Okay, so here, guarantee DNA Creative Social Media, DNA Learning Center, Cold Spring Harbor is probably not the first. So we've created a little search application that searches the web and you can choose by your, um, uh, by your CC BY license if you're only looking for stuff there. So what we're trying to do is, again, make it easy for you to find stuff. Skills Commons, this is where we have, um, I think it's close to 70,000 um, downloadable resources in uh, career and technical uh, education, manufacturing, healthcare, IT, agriculture. Uh, we got lots of stuff, all right? And so, um, and we've created an affordable learning solutions model here for you. And um, so here's an example of financial accounting. We got a bunch of textbooks that are aligned there in career and technical education. We have um, organized by SOC codes, your standard occupational codes. What are all fully online courses or hybrid blended courses that are available, all right? So again, how do you make it easy for you to find these resources? Because if you don't have an open place to make it convenient, where you put in the pot, where everyone can come in and watch, these are important, okay? Inviting solutions. Is this helpful going along here? Just give me a little this, this, this. Thank you, all right. See, if you all did this, we could have gotten more coffee and <laughs> cut this short. All right, inviting solutions. And th this, I think, is really important. Because if you've done the, the first ones, you've engaged people to help inform them. You've validated the needs of our students and our faculty. You've excited them that, oh, this is something I can do. And now you have a place where they can start. Now, how do you get them to contribute, right? because you can't do it by yourself. And this is where your campus members, you understand best what will work on your campus. You understand the people and the culture and the background and enabling that um, derivative of your program to find its home on your institution is really important. 
And so what often that takes is how do you support leadership on your campus? So we have, we call them affordable learning solutions coordinators. We have a lot of information about how do you plan your own ALS, how do you monitor it, how do you coordinate, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of stuff there that, again, you're welcome to use. So once you have the local leaders, then you allow each campus to create their own image of what affordable learning was for them. So here's um, Open Fullerton, CSU Fullerton, Chico, and affordable learning at Pomona, and San Marcos. Their, their um, mascot is the Cougar, so they have the Cougar affordable learning material, so they're calming prices down. They just love that, okay? <laughs> Listen, if that works, that gets the message out, that gets people connected, that inviting solutions rather than saying, here's what you gotta do, right? No, what, what do you have to create? What's the equitable outcome for all our students? And be as inclusive as possible of strategies that will work, all right? And this is why we really looked at all affordable solutions, not just OER, right? Is because we wanted to be as engaging of the entire campus and moving from a print book to a digital book is an intermediate step to move them to more affordable digital resources to moving to open education resources. So you just have to be in it for the long run. Um, the other thing we do is uh, we've been working with HBCUs, and so each of these HBCUs, the Skills Commons uh, Affordable Learning Solution website portal, we just provided them, they say, hey, would you like one? And they customize it themselves, they develop their own programs. And, and years ago we helped Georgia, we've helped SUNY, et cetera, like this. All right, what I'm showing you here is once you invite, uh, you know, invite solutions, they may want to help, and then you have to figure out, well, how do I help? How do I manage this on my campus? So when you have a coordinator, that's just another duties as assigned, how do you help them? So here's a little kind of services that, that we put together, and, and not only say here's the general stuff, what we've also created, and these are available on the um, Skills Common site are Google spreadsheets that allow someone to kind of fill in the blanks. So if this is for what's your plan for curate, discovery, curation, and distribution, right? Who's your stakeholder? How are you going to help them find OER? What's the strategies for curating, right? And you, it, it, you, you give them kind of <laughs> scaffolding questions so they can develop a plan that's right for their institution. So if you're gonna invite solutions, how do you give people tools to make it happen for them? All right. So offering personal contributions and encouraging publicity. So if you, what we've kind of gotten so far is enabled intrinsic commitment, right? By saying someone, I want to help my students succeed in their learning, help them have a more affordable education so they can complete their degree, augment it with some extrinsic, here's a little money to help you do the extra work that it takes, and you provide convenient ways, you give them a solution to help them do these things, you're gonna get people who will take sustainable action. They will change and they'll stay on your team. It won't be a one and done type activity, right? But if you don't kind of build up that culture, that community, and really get their buy-in, they'll do it for the money and then they won't, okay? So how do, what are the ways that we um, really show off the personal contributions and, and you know, encourage pu publicity around these things? And so this is where we've created faculty showcases. So what, what we've done is, this is a little snapshot. So here's um, a boss at uh, CSU Bakersfield. He's using the OpenStax textbooks for economics. The economics textbooks are frequently expensive when they're brand new, right? And 
they create a teaching e-portfolio. They say, what's the book? Oh, here we go. Oop. Wrong button. Is there a laser pointer? There we go. Okay, so here's about the textbook. So they give their description. Here's about the course. And if you scroll down on this web page, they, they actually upload their syllabus. So when someone else is teaching economics, and does anyone else teach economics in the CSU? Yeah, lots of people, right? They could say, oh, is this course like my course? Yeah, oh, look at this. Here's the learning objectives, here's what I'm trying to do, here's a resource, great. And then the last one is about why did I do this? Having the faculty tell their story. And publishing these posters on the web is in a sense some of the first steps for the scholarship of teaching and learning. Because one of the other things we've done with these e-portfolios is the faculty have also began to redesign their courses and start looking and measuring what's the benefit of student learning outcomes. How do the grade distributions now changing in, in my courses? And how do you make this happen at scale? We create a template with scaffolding questions that faculty just have to come in, fill in the blanks, all right? This is done with Merlot Content Builder, free for anyone to use, right? So if you wanna use this, you can take it, put your own picture in, change along, and now it's freely available, we host all these stuff. But what these do, it begins to get the faculty to go back to their homes, cut up the carrots, and now contribute it and show off what they've done. Because reputation is an important element of a faculty's life. Because now this becomes part of their retention, tenure, and promotion file. What they've done, have they contributed to the institute. Now it's not gonna get them tenure, but it's part of the evidence of convicting someone the crime of good work, which is what tenure is about. Okay. Enjoy the fruits of your labors, celebrating your accomplishments. Okay. Party time, really important, okay? Recognition of individual contributions and the celebration of the collective impact, all right? Really important, all right? When you're trying to kind of have a sustained movement, the social learning process and the social support of how you're doing something important is critical to make public. When you hand out awards, Yes, it's for an individual, but most important, you're making public to your community what the values of that institution is. And repeating those values, you can't do it enough about how important it is, all right? So here's an example of what we've accomplished. Um, 1718, we saved $45 million. Almost 19 from our OER, library, and factory authoring side, and 26 million through our um, rental inclusive access programs in the bookstores. Okay, now you can see over time what's been growing, right? We have one of our campuses now have two bachelor's degrees that are textbook free. And they got six more coming along. This is CSU Channel Islands. They have about, I think it's like 10,000 students. It is not a big campus, right? And they're planning a few more now. Who loves this? The president loves the notoriety that they're the first institution to have baccalaureate degrees that are textbook free. Every year, we have an Affordable Learning Solutions Summit where we have our community colleges, UC and CSU. And again, as MJ said, it's really going beyond just the affordability, but the issue around equity and achievement throughout our California campus is an important discussion to have, and we also use that as a celebration. All right. This is CSU Dominguez Hills. Um, this is one of our poor, poor campuses. 
Um, they have, if I remember, their four-year graduation rate is, I think it's around 10%. Um, I think it's close to 90% of our students are on financial aid, okay? So, and there's um, about 750 faculty members. Anybody wanna guess how many faculty are participating in the affordable learning solutions? Now be, think reasonable, think, think like a faculty member, right? Other, right. But anybody wanna take a guess? 20%, I hear 20, 20, 20, do I hear 25, 25, 25, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30? 10, close to 60%, all right? Now, we've been doing this for nine years, okay? So it's taken a while. But what was um, an early reason why we got more faculty involved? Because the faculty already were aware of the needs of their students, and then we gave them a mechanism to be recognized for how they were choosing content that got them to their educational outcomes but were more affordable. And when we put on a party where the provost came, handed out certificates, we had some nice food, right? And I give money to have them do that, okay? Faculty came up and said, well, why wasn't I invited? I'm doing this, I said, oh great, give me your name and we'll begin to take count of these things, right? And so that's why building a culture of how this is important is really important, it is a critical element in getting that recognition. And what we do is again, we provide Google spreadsheets to help the campus ALS coordinator start calculating the savings that they have. If you don't give them a, ne a mechanism, I'll say they're gonna do all crazy things and when you're trying to aggregate across all your institutions, um, it's, it's nuts, all right? So give them actual tools, all right? So all these things are about building capacity and now this is kind of the summary of um, a strategy for here. For us at the bottom, leveraging your content providers. Any for us, anything that reduces the cost, that helps move people from changing how, what resources they're using is a good first step. Creating capabilities, this is where technology has to make things convenient and affordable. Because if you don't give a gift and you're given a burden, it's not going anywhere. Developing the demand. How do you get people to say, I want to do that? Your communications, your training, your professional development, your incentives, all these activities, because you can produce all you want, but if you don't have the demand side, you're not gonna achieve your outcomes. And often, how can you achieve kind of the ecosystem is what are the policies? What's the leadership? your president, your provost, your CFO, uh, VP for student services. What are your business models that you have, all right? Um, building more collaborative, I'm not sure if in libraries you do more collaborative purchasing. We do a lot of that to help get more content for more students at a lower cost, okay? So how do you execute without being executed? So this is one of my favorite signs. <laughs> Um, you know, it's when, um, when an administrator goes, I got a great idea and I want you to do it, you know, in three months. And it's like, all right, running with scissors. So give a gift and not a burden. Showcase exemplary practices. Sharing what you're doing. And I think, again, why you're doing it here. Give choices, all right? If you want to engage people, you have to say, you choose what's the best, what you think is the best. You have to believe in the integrity of their judgment. And let them, and build locally, link globally. Project management tools, I really gotta reinforce that when you're supporting many campuses. So shall we create stone soup and move the world with innovations, right? 
because only collective we, we can do that. And the last thing in the stone stoop store, the stone, stone soup story, yes, I'm from California where pot is legal, but I'm not stoned, okay, <laughs> um, is you say thank you. So thank you so much for the invitation to be here, and I hope this is useful. I'm not sure if there's any time for questions. We're, we're okay. Yes. Thank you for a wonderful talk. One of the helpful ideas is involved. But I'm wondering how you approach peer review of materials that are going up online. Great peer review, really important. So. Um, We've leveraged what we've been doing in Merlot for 20 years. So the question was about peer review, right? And so establishing a community of people who are content experts, really important, right? Because peers need to be trusted, okay? Now, what they need is a rubric for evaluating those materials, right? And so um, for the, in California, um, and, and this is not a joke, folks, the legislators established the California OER Council. Now, what's the abbreviation of that? Coerce. <laughs> okay? Uh, no joke, right? Right? And because this is in peer review, you don't want coercing going, right? So, so what we had to do is we had to get faculty together. We had to say, okay, let's work through what are the evaluation rubrics about quality of content, about its pedagogical effectiveness, about its ease of use. So those are the categories we've been using Merlot for 20 years. And of course, our faculty didn't want to use those because those are not California ones. So they came up with four of them that look like three of them that we have in Merlot. And that's great, okay? And if you want to use those templates, we have those templates to, as a starting point to see how you may want to do it. And then you got to norm people's use of the rubrics, right? So this is really about establishing a community of people. You're, you're in a sense starting a journal, a, scholar, a scholarly activity, and, um, and we paid people, right? We paid them, I think we paid them 150 bucks um, to review some of these things, okay? Other questions? If not, I'll be around all day. Feel free to, to uh, ask me questions uh, through the day.